I wait for some to stop. Thank you. Thank you, Human, for the introduction. And uh, it's a pleasure to be here at WHO. Um, I was asked to talk about the identification and control of tropical disease vectors. And it made me think about why it is that into protecting humans from mosquitoes. And that became the centerpiece in the history of malaria control. And it would seem to be a rather simple story. Um, and, but it's, I would suggest it's a bit more complex than it appears. But the simple story begins, you know, there we go, begins, as most of you know, with the discoveries of Charles Laverin of the plasmodia of the causes malaria, and the work of Ross and Grassi in determining the role of the Anopheles in sense fitting malaria. Um, and we get this, uh, uh, which makes it fairly obvious that if you can just eliminate those mosquitoes, you can stop transmission and you can prevent malaria from occurring. Uh, and to do this, a number of technologies were developed. Block oil, and Paris green later on, spraying for adult mosquitoes, fumigating uh, pyrethroids in various forms, later DDT we'll talk about, and um, screening of houses to prevent mosquitoes from entering. Um, there were a number of early successes using vector control uh, methods. Watson, Malcolm Watson was successful in draining large areas around uh, rubber plantations and protecting workers there. Um, his methods were adopted by Swelling Grebel in Indonesia, but he refined them by identifying the specific species that was causing transmission, identifying its breeding habits, and eliminating the places in which it spread. Um, later on, William Gorgas in uh, Panama, uh, eliminating both uh, yellow fever using vector control methods, highly successful. And then the Rockefeller Foundation engaged in a number of vector control uh, opportunity, uh, efforts in the Americas. But vector control is costly. And because of the costs of vector control and the drainage projects that went along with it, it was often limited to places of industrial production, plantations, or in urban areas. And it left large areas of the country protected. It also required detailed entomological knowledge in order to really define the specific species and their breeding areas. And it worked better in some of the was uh, Anopheles quadrimaculatus that bred in still waters um, using oils and Paris green and eliminating those breeding sites worked very well, where in much of Europe where the major uh, uh, vector was uh, Anopheles maculopanus um, and where it bred in it didn't work so well. For many, however, malaria and vector, con I mean, vector control was not the central uh, approach, and that they saw malaria as a medical problem, following the uh, ideas of Robert Koch, who said to treat the patient, this is working on its own, it's great, uh, uh, treat the patient, not the mosquito, uh, who had argued the widespread use of um, quinine uh, could, in fact, was much less expensive uh, when it's eliminated the, the plasmodia within the body. Um, and, and this thing, um, the supporters of um, the medical approach pointed out that in many parts of Europe, for example, you had large populations of Anopheles mosquitoes, but you had no malaria. And so this was the phenomenon known as Anophilism without malaria, and they argued that it was wasting of energy and They were not causing malaria. So that was sort of an obstacle to the, to the vector control and was one of the reasons why others um, argued that you should be actually just treating people uh, and usually that was the Italian uh, who distributed free quitting broadly across the countryside and it had a dramatic impact shown here on mortality. It jumped up during World War I when the Um, came back down again. And it's important to point out that the um, distribution of quinine was also done alongside massive public education. And not just education about malaria, but as Frank Snowden has pointed out, 
basic education, the creation of peasant schools, so improving the educational capacity of the population. The problems with quinine distribution was that it really didn't do anything about transmission, even though they thought it would when they initiated uh, the program in Italy. Uh, uh, goes along, and whereas if you're actually doing better control well, you can actually eliminate transmission in particular areas. The second problem is that there is a real need to have cooperation on the part of the population at risk, a higher level of cooperation than is necessary uh, in um, vector control. That's part. A third group, uh, a problem, but it's a social problem. And some of the same people who worked and worked, uh, saw it as a medical problem, also understood that there was a social base for malaria. Um, Angelo Celli, an Italian who worked on the quinine project, but who looked at the history of malaria uh, in Europe and its history of disappearance without any direct effort to eliminate the malaria uh, and saw that basically malaria had disappeared as a result of social and economic development, particularly agriculture development, and they argued that malaria flees before the plow and proposed that in order to eliminate malaria, you needed to have large-scale rural development and development of agriculture known as bonification. Uh, he also pointed out that bad development could, in fact, increase malaria problems, and that's what he said was going on in southern Italy, where workers were coming from the mountain towns and going down to the largest states in the plains and being exposed to malaria. He argued that higher wages, improved working conditions, housing, and diet were the first step to combating malaria. Chuck S.P. James from Great Britain pointed out that the history of malaria in England followed a similar course with the diminution of local malaria in England was due neither to natural causes nor to the intentional application of any particular preventive method reputed to be specific, but to the progressive improvements of a social, economic, educational, medical, and public health character. Um, this is England in the late 1860s where malaria in the darker areas is seen. Um, during the 17th and 18th century, these areas uh, around the Fens in, in the southeast of England were drained. Um, early drainage tended to make the problem worse, but with the development of windmills and hydraulic pumps, um, drainage occurred. Farmland was opened up, uh, increasing herd of cattle, improved housing went along with the increased economic well-being, and eventually England grew out of malaria. Um, similarly, in the United States, as Akronek has pointed out, the upper Mississippi Valley, malaria disappeared in largely as a result of um, improved economic betterment. And this is M.A. Barber. It was seen that even a moderate betterment of social conditions, malaria in the U.S. tends to disappear. Nearly every phase of economic improvement has had some effect on the reduction. And Barber was actively involved in vector control in the southern United States, I'll point out. In the 1920s, the League of Nations in which places, and it uh, came to a number of conclusions, one of which the Commission feels bound to reiterate the importance of the general social hygienic conditions of a people. Better housing and ampler, more varied dietary and better environmental conditions make for more intelligent and willing people and for greater individual resistance. There were a number of experiments uh, which tried to blend disease control, and particularly malaria control, with rural rehabilitation, the development of agriculture and industry. The most famous was in the Pontine Marshes in Italy, where you had a major operation under the Italian government in the 1920s, uh, which led to a population which is about 2,000 people, mostly sickly, very little agriculture, and, and 200,000 acres of malaria, of, of farmland being opened up. Again, you're not just draining it, but you're putting in agriculture, you're putting in industry um, and education and uh, improving the general well-being of the people. There are a number of other uh, examples of linking malaria control and rural uplift. Palestine in the 1920s, the Tennessee Valley Association in the 1930s in the American South, the League of Nations Rural Rehabilitation Program in Jiangxi Province of China in the 1930s, and the International Health Division's Rural Health and Development Program in North China in 1935, all combined general uh, social education economic improvement with malaria control.
summarize the pre-World War II approaches, three things I think need to be made clear. One, that it was not a single approach, but there were a number of different approaches. Vector control was not the dominant um, means of controlling malaria prior to World War II. More important, often in many cases, different methods were used simultaneously. In the of all this economic development, they were using drainage, they were using quinine, um, and, and Charles, I mean, William sites. And thirdly, there was widespread understanding of the importance of social forces played in malaria and the need for social betterment uh, to improve malaria situation. But by the end of the 1930s, things began to change, and they changed for a number of reasons. Fred Soper's success in eradicating the Anopheles Gambia mosquito that had invaded Brazil in uh, the late 1930s, early 40s, um, was a major victory for vector control, and the Rockefeller Foundation widely proclaimed it. Louis Hackett and Alberto Miseroli uh, in Italy unraveled the problem of Anopheles without malaria, showing that the major um, species of uh, Anopheles macropenis, in fact, had a number of subspecies, some of which fed off animal populations, some of which animal populations, you weren't going to get much malaria. And that was why you had so much malaria. Finally, World War II um, saw a narrowing of entomological research as the Japanese controlling quinine production areas in the east made quinine use uh, more difficult. And the need for very rapid control of malaria led entomologists, particularly in the United States, to uh, turn their attention to the development of pesticides. Um, of course, the most important contributor to the rise of uh, vector control in the 1940s was the development of DDT, which could control malaria for long periods of time very cheaply. So the spraying of huts and houses could result in control of malaria for six months to a year. As I said, it was cheap and it was allowed for vector control to be applied to whole countries, not just areas of economic and social development. Uh, in 1947, the Rockefeller International Health Division has made earlier methods of malaria control superfluous. Still, some of those who were deeply engaged in the use of pesticides and spraying, as was Paul Russell, recognized that there was still the social determinants and you needed to have integrated um, malaria approaches or approaches to malaria. That physicians, malariologists, sanitarians integrate their activity with those of agriculturalists, demographers, social scientists, economists, educators, political and religious leaders is of the utmost importance. You just can't do it alone. There needs to be a broad scale integrated approach. However, this kind of broad-scale approach became politically unacceptable from the late 30s onward. And there was a changing political environment in Western Europe and the United States, as indicated in 1938, by the failure of Asia in the 1930s, which I talked about, to be imported into Latin America. Hugh Cummings was the uh, director of the Pan, Pan American Sanitation Bureau, he was also the Surgeon General for the United States, and he should not be tried and allowed into the Americans. Um, it was during this period that the leadership of um, the League of Nations Health Organization, uh, the, which had been fairly liberal uh, at the time, was purged, and more conservative groups moved in. Um, and during the Cold War, uh, after World War II, Cold War politics also shaped what I call the division of labor, as Socrates Litsios has shown. So after the war, the UN organizations are created, and you get the World Health Organization working with health, you get FAO agriculture, you get ILO with economy, and each part is doing its own, but no one is thinking about the whole picture, and it becomes very difficult talk about that big picture and to create these big overreaching kinds of organizations. So in the end, what happens is spraying becomes the major approach and attack to malaria in the 1950s. The success of spraying using DDT plus the fear that resistance 
mutants would emerge uh, amongst Anopheles mosquito, led the World Health Assembly to pass in 1955 the Global Malaria Eradication Program, uh, which is aimed was malaria across the globe. As we now know, that did not work. This is a map which shows if you take all the colors together, that's where malaria existed in 1946. The areas that are yellow to the north and a few places to the south are the areas unprotected uh, and malaria continued. Uh, this was a major embarrassment uh, within the WHO, the failure to achieve that. And after uh, 1969, when the, the plug was pulled on eradication, there was a shift away from eradication uh, and back to a different approach. So what went wrong with eradication? Um, there are a lot, of, a lot of things have been written about the failure of eradication, and I'm not going to go into all the details, but a number of things which I think are important here is one, the over-reliance on a single approach, right? spraying, which was, was basically dominant, vector control. This was the heyday, the, the high point of the dominance of vector control. Lack of research and development into alternatives. The important because at the end of the day, you had to be able to identify the remaining cases and treat them. Otherwise, they became sources of infections to mosquitoes and transmission would again in malaria programs, meaning that the programs had to go in many cases in which the failure to recognize the importance of the social determinants of malaria undermined eradication program. So after the program was terminated, there was a shift away from the single approach and a return to multiple strategies efforts to integrate malaria into the basic health services, and an emphasis on treatment, community participation, and integrated vector management. One of the most successful integrated programs occurred in El Salvador in the 1980s. This involved several approaches. One was epidemiological mapping, figuring out where malaria was severe within the countryside and focusing your resources there. Entomological surveillance. Um, basically seeing when the population of vectors rose to a certain uh, level, and when they did, you sent in the spray teams, rather than sort of spraying on a regular basis. Um, environmental control, eliminating breeding sites. Um, and one of the most important and central parts of this was the volunteer collaboration program, in which people who had fevers went to volunteers in the village. and blood slides were taken and sent to a central um, testing area. Uh, and if they were positive, they were given a full dose of chloroquine and treated. The program run by the United States Public Health Service and the Dorsey was tremendously successful, uh, as shown here. Uh, it's, of course, important to recognize Pepe Nachra has shown that, in fact, the period in which malaria disappeared in El Salvador was a period in which the cotton industry tanked. And as it turns out, the cotton industry was a major creator of conditions which had fostered malaria within El Salvador prior to 1980. So there was, in fact, a social improvement element, even though it wasn't intentional, which was linked to all these other things that were going on that were created by the program. This period in the 1970s and 80s that you see the decline of residual spring as a primary weapon in the war against malaria. The Garkey trial design program designed to see if you could, in fact, eliminate malaria in particular areas of Africa using uh, residual spraying with DDT. Um, it was very successful, but in the end failed to eliminate uh, malaria uh, or to, to end transmission, and it became then an indicator that residual spraying was not the way to go. 1979, the expert committee report of the uh, malaria, malaria expert committee report laid out four different potential strategies for dealing with malaria, only one of which included residual spraying. Nineteen, dismantle their centralized malaria control programs and spraying operations and integrate 
And finally, we talked about later, when rollback malaria was initiated, um, inter, um, residual spraying was eliminated or was not supported as one of the interventions that was being uh, uh, advocated by rollback malaria. So one of the reasons for the decline in IRS uh, in initial spring, residual spring, first there's the effects of the failure of the eradication program, which had the tendency to discredit it. Second, there was a lost generations of malariologists and entomologists. Malaria had become a done story. It's all over. You don't have to worry about it anymore because we've got DDT, and many people just didn't go into the field during the 50s and 60s. The primary health care movement shifted energies and focuses at the, the local level and away from centralized vertical programs, uh, which IRS was. The environmental lobby raised issues about the environmental impact of um, pesticides on the environment. And finally, I would argue that neoliberalism beginning in the 1980s and a move away from government-directed programs, a decentralization and market-led um, development programs um, generated and encouraged by the World Bank also played a role in the decline of IRS uh, as a major weapon. Finally, during this period, you also see major declines in funding for malaria control. Multilateral funding declined by 13 percent. Staff was cut dramatically, as shown here. UNICEF staff was also cut during the same period. And national programs were cut back. Foreign aid dropped in general here in India, and malaria came back. Uh, and you see this happening. This is Southeast Asia. Uh, this is the Americas. Um, a major resurgence of malaria in the 1980s. And it's response to that that rollback malaria was initiated as a joint operation by the World Health Organization, the World Bank, UNICEF, UNDP, PMOS, and bilateral organizations. Here the four main interventions that initiated were the use of insecticide-treated nets, uh, intermittent treatment of pregnant women uh, to prevent malaria in pregnancy and low birth rates, um, the rapid identification and treatment of children who come down with fevers, and the rapid uh, created by refugee camps, which I'll get to in a minute. Later, uh, artemisinin-based therapies were added into the mix, widely became first-line drugs in a number of countries. And finally, in 2006, the, world, the rollback malaria began supporting IRS again. But what you have here, in, uh, in opposition to what you saw in malaria eradication, is a wide, or it appears to be, a wide menu of approaches to dealing with malaria. In addition, the global strategy from Larry, which was published, which was written in 1992, which became the rollback malaria, stated that malaria control is not the isolated concern of the health worker. It requires partnerships of community members, involvement in those involved in education and the environment, general water supply, integral part of national health development and health concerns must be an integral part of national development. So again, the whole notion of social development has come back in, at least on paper, for rollback malaria. Now, as I say, you seem to have an array of things going here. But here's the budget estimates under the latest global plan for action. If you take 2009, which you're into, or even if you look at 2010, they basically are the same. And what you find is that 99% whether it's using of nets or it's IRS, which is now up to 46% in the budget, or 61% of the total budget being outlaid for malaria. Intermittent therapy gets less than 1%. Case management is 15% of the whole budget. R&D, 12.5%, and infrastructure structure equals 4%. So this is very heavily weighted back toward vector control. In other words, vector control has come back even though on paper it looks like there's a wider array of, slush, of, of efforts and uh, opportunities and strategies being employed. In addition, basically what's going on almost totally ignores the underlying social determinants of malaria, despite what's said on paper. And these are just four areas. Civil this statement. Weaknesses in the social economic development, such as poverty, poor quality of housing, limited access to health care, limit the feasibility and effectiveness of malaria control strategy. 
the NACID or intervention which compounded with human resource crisis in the public health sector have led to fragmented implementation of control strategies that were limited in scale and in, population, in the populations targeted. This again is from the Global Malaria Eradication Program, a plan. It's the only statement in that 300-page document that says anything about development other than development being undermined by malaria. And very little is done as a result of the projects that come out of that. Wars and refugees. This is a map which shows where conflicts, armed conflicts have occurred in Africa. And I've used Africa because Africa is where, you know, 90% of malaria is occurring in 2009. Warfare weakens health systems, disrupts malaria control, transforms the environment, and displaces population. And I'll give you an example of Eastern Zaire or Eastern Congo. Uh, services centers were destroyed, many of them intentionally during the Civil War, which continues today. 2003 and 4, there was an effort to, to uh, distribute 500,000 uh, ITNs across eastern uh, Congo. Only 24,000 were distributed as a result of the disruption that was going on. Large areas of forest cover were destroyed, opening those areas up for breeding of Anopheles gambia mosquito. And malaria caused an estimated 45% of childhood deaths compared to 25% world and the rest. Refugees and malaria displaced populations is more difficult to protect. Displaced populations exposed to malaria has occurred in southern Sudan. Uh, populations fleeing from uh, raiding government uh, troops moved into swamp areas and uh, became uh, infected with malaria. Refugees can introduce malaria into low-risk areas as occurred in Burundi in 1990 and camps produce malaria. So here's a few facts. Malaria is the leading cause of In 2007, malaria caused 21% of refugee deaths, 26% of under five deaths. Malaria caused 20% of total mortality morbidity and 25% of under five morbidity. 13% of all cases reported by WHO linked to forced migration and civil war. You can't ignore this if you're trying to eliminate malaria. Malaria and poverty, this is Jeff Sachs' map, famous map where he shows a relationship between GNP and, and, and malaria index. Him argue, he's arguing that malaria undermines uh, economic growth, but it works the other way as he admitted that poverty can be accountable for some of the intense malaria transmission. Um, this is just a graph of economic GNP uh, per capita. And after a growth rate during the 60s and 70s in much of Africa, the recession of the 1980s basically undermined African economic growth for a long period of time to the point where today we're still recession, it's estimated that growth in Africa will be a half of what it was in 2008. And this economic development or growth of GDP in Africa, the dark brown line compared to uh, Southeast Asia and South Asia. Malaria and poverty, malaria in, uh, prevents individuals from uh, protecting themselves, limits their ability to uh, cure the sick, and places people at risk. This is social economic status. There's a whole series of studies of use of um, ITNs, though. The fact that ITNs are no longer required to be um, so bought but are being given away free probably uh, changes this considerably in many places. This example from Zimbabwe where hundreds of thousands of young men and women left the highlands where there was no malaria, moved out to the lowlands during the recession of the 90s in order to pan for gold, and malaria moved from 25 per thousand in 92 to 150,000 in 202. National poverty undermines preventive services, undermines the ability to provide health care. This is just Zambia, where the economy is dropped between 1970 and 2003, as seen by GDP here, $1,600 to $900 per capita over that period of time. Health expenditure went from $23 to $11 per capita, and by 2005, half the clinics were closed. This is what happened as a result of this in terms of immunizations in Zambia and malaria during that period, as malaria control basically disappeared over by the end of that period for much of the country. 
So the impact on the health services. This is Director General, WHO. Africa's health systems are too weak and services are too under-resourced to support top Just a series of questions we need to ask. Have we put too much power in faith in the power of insecticides yet again? Are we narrowing activities it's too much that we're going down a similar path in the 1960s, 70s? Can we eliminate malaria without investment in the health infrastructure? Can we eliminate malaria without addressing problems of poverty, violence, and displaced population? Now, I would argue that the answer is no to all of those questions. And yet, none of those things seem to be on the radar screen very largely in terms of what we're now doing in terms of malaria. And I would end with two quotes. This is from Ronald Ross from 1911. It's about the more quinine policy, but an opportunistic policy that uses any weapon we can. And I would say every weapon we can. And finally, from E.A. Winslow, C.E.A. Winslow, probably one of the most prominent public health authorities in the United States during the 1950s and 60s. Public health programs cannot be planned in a vacuum, but only as a vital part of a broad program for social improvement. It is not enough, then, for the health administrator to develop the soundest possible program in his own field of social endeavor. He must also sit down with experts on agriculture, industry, economics, and education. development. Now I conclude by sort of reinforcing that and saying that the way forward is to go back to the past and think about how we can integrate all these approaches in order to have more success in controlling malaria. Thank you. Um, okay, well, um, let's thank very much uh, Professor Packard for his speech. Uh, I can show he's provoked quite a few questions, but we'll keep the questions for the moment and have our second speaker now, uh, and that is um, Professor Axel Kruger, who um, is from the Liverpool School of Tropical Medicine. Currently, he's been seconded to WHO, and um, uh, Professor Kruger is very interested in the whole area of implementation and operational research. Um, he's also been awarded the SOPA Prize um, uh, the SOPA Award for, for his, the, his work he's done in this field, and that's the, the significance of that will become obvious when he makes his, his presentation. Thank you very much for the invitation. I'm, I'm not an entomologist and I'm not a historian and I will talk about historical aspects of entomology but uh, I've seen many colleagues here around who can help with difficult questions at the end. I will start with a simple slide which uh, intends to on diseases are uh, on the uprise um, and this as an introduction to the question if 100 years of uh, evidence collection um, was good enough to give us now the necessary knowledge and tools for organizing um, successful vector control programs. And um, I called, uh, put as a title, Managing Disease Vectors, Lessons Learned, Lessons Ignored. Oops. I have three chapters. Uh, the first is the introduction and take a special look at uh, indoor residual spraying and uh, finally at the lessons learned or not learned. In the introductory uh, um, a section, I will give the panorama of who they are, these uh, vectors and their diseases, where do they occur, how do, they, uh, do we know, and what are the control options. So, in some inside a child just admitted to us 
distributor with uh, severe dengue. Then you have here malaria drug distributors uh, for severe malaria. You have spleen examination for visceral leishmaniasis. You have Chagas disease with a typical Romania sign. Arises. Most of them are <clears throat> what we call neglected diseases, neglected by donors, neglected even by uh, national governments. Uh, only one of them, malaria, has um, done it to get into the Millennium Development Goals, uh, but continues to be a major threat for development and for people's health. These are the vectors, uh, the insects, I'm talking in this speech about um, insect vectors, Chagas vectors on the left hand side, then you have the dengue vector in the middle, uh, you have anopheles for the malaria transmission and sand flies for leishmaniasis. We have heard already that we sometimes think that these vectors are the weakest link in the tran transmission chain, but we have also seen this seems to be not the truth because they are here these little beasts for long uh, enough and they are, seem to be spreading in many places instead of uh, diminishing. Uh, where are they located? There is a belt around our belt for tropical diseases. There are insects all over the place. Uh, up to Alaska or Fireland, but uh, the main disease vectors and subtropics. How do we know? A short review of our uh, pioneers, the winners, but also the victims, the losers. Three of them, three of the, uh, say, important um, contributors to our knowledge um, in the early days, Patrick Manson, already in 1878 uh, detected um, in 1897 the transmission of malaria by uh, Anopheles mosquitoes and then just 100 years ago Carlos Chagas, uh, Chagas disease transmission by uh, triatomine uh, vectors. But there were not only the winners, there were also the losers, and one of them is Clara Mas, victim of vector-borne disease research. She was one of the volunteers accepting to be um, bitten by a yellow fever mosquito, and she died uh, one week later. Um, she was, this happened in Havana and Cuba, and she was later uh, reburied at home. So these were heroic, heroic times with heroic interventions, and, uh, but which has produced basic evidence we are still uh, taking advantage of. Now where are we now? This is the last section in my introduction in the early days and today. And in fact, between these two ages uh, is DDT. DDT is something like um, vector control before DDT and after DDT. In the early <coughs> um, parts of the uh, 20th century, we had basically screening of houses, the mosquito nets, the drainage and filling of swamps, oil, and we had already some biological environmental interventions. So here on the left you see uh, larvae sites put into water barrels, fishes, and also spraying <coughs> in the fields, basically for killing the larvae. Nowadays, we have uh, many more control options, uh, starting with the biological ones. Here, the famous copper pots. These are small animals put into water containers uh, in Vietnam, basically to eat up the um, Aedes larvae for dengue control. mainly uh, used in Myanmar, again, against for dengue control. Then we have the fishes, larva virus uh, fishes. Uh, then we have clean up the, the, these packages of lime, lime plus control and other forms of ecosystem management. <coughs> Bone is still the chemical 
uh, control, the chemical vector control, and I put the two most important ones in red, IRS, indoor residual spraying, and ITNs, insecticide-treated netting material. Then we have uh, now quite a number of very potent anti-larval anti uh, chemicals, uh, puriproxifene, this is on the right hand side, you see it, it, it blocks the development from pupae to adult mosquitoes, temifos for malaria, for basically for dengue control, BTI, <coughs> are famous examples in this group. Uh, we have insecticide lid covers, we have uh, to a certain extent the fogging, and finally in the other category genetically modified vectors which are coming up in the future. So if you look at this we have quite a large arsenal of um, vector control interventions um, and tools, but how do we get them to the people? This is uh, the major question. And this I will now um, deal with in the second chapter when I talk about the IRS story. Uh, IRS, indoor residual spraying, because it, ha it has a long history and it is, has a renaissance in recent years. It is coming back and it is now again on uh, the table for uh, vector control even in African countries. The RS story, <clears throat> first, what is the aim of indoor residual spraying? What effort is needed? What, what are the costs? What did we achieve? We had already some examples. What are the managerial and political um, conditions? Uh, the aim is like this, a reduction of ve vector density. You see a number of vectors per hour. For a long time, they of the disease, of their disease. The effort needed, we talk a lot about insecticide, but we forget about the machines which are necessary to put the insecticide on the wall. And we do not, I think, neglect sometimes all these people who are doing the job, the spraying squads, which are in many countries hundreds of people who rely on these equipments. Um, here a special example from India, it's a bit old-fashioned, a stir-up pump, but you see a typical spraying quad, a squad, one uh, does the pumping, the other does the spraying, and the third one does the mixing of the uh, insecticide. Uh, and um, on the right hand down you see the supervisor who marks their houses. Um, it's probably not a very efficient way, but they do it and did it for the last decades and there are thousands of them uh, covering malaria and uh, leash and uh, LF areas of the countries. Um, so, liquid programs, which uh, Randy has mentioned already, it was practiced at a massive scale during enabled by DDT, which was discovered in uh, 1939 uh, and then made popular, say, in the early 40s. It was strengthened by the malaria eradication program. organized as independent vertical program. In most countries, it was not even part of the Ministry of Health. It was like a separate ministry managing uh, vertically uh, the spraying uh, plants. It was planned usually in a kind of eradication mood for a limited time period, three to five years. And uh, then governments would, or the presidents of the governments would be told, after five years, we have eradicated the disease. We go down, and uh, this is the one everything is done. It was not applied at least scale in high endemic areas of sub-Saharan sub Africa. So this is more or less the the overview of uh, how it all started. But um, 
let us think about uh, the first days, the origin of the, of all this. Turn uh, the the qualities, and w there we come to one name who was um, very um, important in that time. This is in fact a copy of his passport, Fred Sober, already mentioned. Um, Fred uh, Sober was born uh, 1893 in Kansas, and he worked for the in his uh, the peak of his career for the rock. Um, once when he was on mission in Brazil, pulled by his staff there, um, a very efficient from the Brazilian government and asked for help, but they ignored it. And two years later, they had one of the biggest malaria epidemics on the coast of uh, Brazil. Uh, five years later, uh, the uh, Anopheles Gambia has extended to an area of 200 by 200 kilometers along the coast. And then the Brazilian gov uh, government asked uh, SOPA for help. Um, he went in and organized a military-like operation. <coughs> but having as the only weapon diesel oil and Paris green, which is an arsenic larvicide, um, efficient where you apply it, but you have to apply it everywhere. And with an unprecedented um, operation, it took him 22 months to get rid of uh, Anopheles Gambia in Brazil. this thinking about massive um, interventions against uh, vectors, major disease vectors. Um, I put it here as Fred Soper's obsession with IRS. He was really an obsessed man because he organized uh, like a general his, um, his interventions. His principles were apply motivation, discipline and organization. His approach was uniforms for the malaria inspectors, rigorous protocol for inspecting houses, mapping, assign inspectors to each sector. And even when we did our studies on any kind of public health um, um, surveys on diarrheal diseases or on respiratory infections in Latin America, we went to the malaria services to Get the old earth, but sometimes you have still to go there and ask for more details. Who found larvae that had been looked over by the inspectors, fee reduction, so kinds of punishment and kind of reward for performance. Um, so the achievements which followed this interventions, uh, very well organized. Um, control services. Um, this uh, picture shows the elimination of dengue vectors from the Americas in the, uh, from the 30s to the 70s. Uh, but you see also what is quite typical, and we will have some more examples of it, this uh, rebound effect. You, uh, lo you lose the and you get uh, the same or a worse situation than before. Other success stories are elimination of chagas in 80s, 90s, but again, now we are in front of at least partial in some of these areas. Elimination of malaria from subtropical areas, they are very impressive uh, data. Uh, in uh, India, you had around 70 million uh, malaria cases, which were reduced by IRS to less than 1 million. Uh, so there are many examples showing how successful this was, but the story goes on. Even already serious problems arose, insecticide resistance was already um, uh, noticed and uh, reported at the end of um, 
the 1940s, mid-1950s, environmental disequilibrium. Uh, one example, which is from where on because the caterpillars were eating up uh, the thatched uh, the, the roof uh, because their natural animals were killed by DDT and the bed bugs uh, also uh, multiplied because their natural anim enemies had been killed by DDT. Then in 62 it was already mentioned there was a very famous and influential book by Rachel Carlson The Silent Spring which put into the limelight the FDDT spraying in agriculture and in public health. Then uh, early reports which came is and uh, are still valid until now, corruption with insecticides, that the poor sprayers get uh, additional income through selling the insecticides to the farmers. Then uh, the massive reinfestation in previously free areas. And finally, uh, people's resistance to IRS, particularly the better off they didn't like DDT, has the disadvantage first of smelling and sexually. Um, I want to show uh, all this uh, to make clear that. Um, it is not only DDT by itself, but it is a whole context which leads the IRS programs. Some of the um, factors um, associated with the decline in program efficiency we have heard already, loss of national international funding, more in expensive new insecticides, then what is sometimes overseen, there was at least in Latin America and Asia very powerful malaria uni unions who got um, uh, uh, privileges for themselves and their work, which finally uh, jeopardized their, their own uh, uh, jobs and their own And then in the 90s, the decade of the 90s is more the, the decade of health sector decentralization of the health sectors, which offered opportunity and other vector borne disease services into general health services led frequently to a better uh, diagnostic system. Um, and led to a better uh, treatment in many cases because before that the vertical malaria program was responsible for treating people and uh, for doing the diagnosis. Now it is just, this is probably associated with reduction in mortality. Massive reduction of workforce uh, in most countries you find the reduction by loss of authority, and finally lack of program ex expertise, particularly at district and sub-district level, uh, where frequently and now the mayor is responsible for um, IRS. Then um, there was also a decline in public attention due to decrease in malaria mortality, urbanization of large population groups, but also uh, particularly again for these two continents, new challenges for vector control in terms of dengue, lymph of politicians and of uh, public health planners. And finally, the advent of new tools, particularly insecticide-treated nets. Um, let me have a very small, uh, say, footnote for the ITNs. It took around 10 years to get the research findings on ITNs into the national programs in Africa. In Africa, particularly, now it is also extending to the other um, endemic regions of the world. Uh, mainly supported by massive international funds, but also mainly a vertical distribution pattern. And um, we have to ask of ourselves if the IRS story will be repeated here. 
So first attempt to learn something from the early days of of your intervention, IRS is not sufficient to eradicate malaria or any other vector-borne disease. Did we learn the lesson or not? The weakness of managerial and political systems as well as human nature have to be taken into account. Human nature, I mean people are not only interested in society altruistically uh, offering their services, they are thinking of their family of their income and of their commodities and this has not been taken into account into in the um, old uh, in the organization of the old uh, programs and the third one massive investment does not guarantee sustainable success in terms of reducing vector densities to threshold level if performance level if performance at It looks in the residual spraying today. I will um, very quickly show you something on the complexity of such programs, on the efforts needs, on the major threats, and on political and other in, in, in interferences. This is here an example from India, national uh, program, vector control program. And it shows only for the pro procurement of insecticides all the steps you have to do to get it from the planning stage to the implementation stage. These are 14 months of work with seven different steps. It starts to assess the insecticide requirements. Then budget allocation. You see it is March, April, but April, like in Britain, the new uh, financial year starts. So it's a bit problematic frequently to uh, And also governments, local governments, state governments, national governments, and again you might have a, de a delay here. And so it goes on until you have here the, 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 the industry, they need three months to produce the necessary tons of uh, the insecticide, and finally you get it through. So the main message is it's a very complex operation. Annual costs in India, they spend 24 spraying per, per year, but it is still perceived to be cost effective. DDT per household spread is 1.6. For, for dengue vectors, it's a very similar story. Now, what are the results? Um, I give you only a few examples. One is you can test how good uh, the sprayers have worked by fixing filter papers on the walls, like this here, this one here, and then they don't know that you have done it, and then you examine the filter paper and compare uh, the, uh, the insecticide concentration with the target doses. And here in country A we found between 60 and 80 percent of uh, the actual doses on or concentration on the wall was achieved, but in country B you see only 7 percent of the target doses were 5 million dollars. It's a poor country per year on IRS and what they do is to spray water. Um, DDT has an a disadvantage for supervisors because you can see the powder on the on, on the walls and you can see how, oh, here you have a regular spray, but here you have areas with irregular spray on the uh, right hand side here, the, the spray didn't get here. But then you can see already on the left down here he is spraying over food which he should never do. They are spraying here over all the, uh, the utensils uh, the, which are hanging on the walls, which they shouldn't do. They should uh, uh, ask people to take them off before they start spraying. Beautiful uh, protective clothes to minimize the contact of uh, the sprayer as with insecticide, but the reality is often this here. 
They touch the insecticide, they mix the insecticide with their hands, and uh, they have no protective uh, clothing at all. Um, this is frequently not even due to procurement. They have this, but they are working in a hot environment for eight hours per day, and uh, they're doing it like this. Um, then what you have to see how the condition of the pump, if they mix the insecticide properly, if they shake the pump, the distance of the nozzle to the surface area, the spray was the marking of the... How if organize national programs, you frequently see there is a lot of um, uh, performance problems in all these areas. But there are also additional problems, political problems, managerial problems. Uh, sorry, we couldn't start because of the elections. So postpone, and then the monsoon is coming. So you problem of the budget, same problem. We could not finish because the monsoon came early. We could not complete because we ran out of insecticide. We could not continue because of industrial action by our spray uh, people, etc., etc. This gives you an idea how complex uh, indoor residual spraying is. And uh, therefore, relatively simple lessons, staff training is important, performance monitoring are crucial for the success, and this in fact comes still from Fred Soberstein. This is what he was very much insisting on. Political programs, natural in the sense they are the rule, they are not the exceptions. You have to deal with them. You shouldn't close your eyes. You be aware of it and uh, try to, to at least to minimize the effect. So he said, no, you have to do it this way and uh, nothing else uh, is good. Combination with other vector control more, uh, methods are unavoidable. Uh, again, Fred Soper in his time, he said, no, you have to do one thing very good and then forget about the rest. And we, I think, have learned it doesn't work like this. Um, lessons learned, I talk very briefly briefly about IVM strategy, about the need for intelligent control services, comprehensive view of vector ecology, EVM and involvement of communities. Here I am happy to see our IVM represented. It's basically it pulls together all the different ideas and in fact it is a learning experience to bring the different sectors together to involve communities, integrate different And there will be very soon a conference to see what has been done. We need a little blueprint. They, they have to analyze data. They have to analyze what they are doing. Supported, hopefully, by, by uh, modern information technology. We have to understand much better and respond much better to the complexity of vector dynamics. So we have now the, the technologies of landscape mapping, ecotrope characterization, and studying much better how vectors behave. Selective vector control, targeting productive containers for dengue control. This is a nice example of Myanmar, where they use these simple cotton nets to eliminate, to take off the uh, immature uh, stages of the mosquitoes. Environmental management, lime plastering in Nepal, India, Bangladesh for sand fly control, understanding people's attitudes towards the community cooperatives in Mexico for malaria control and dengue control and we have other activities where the community can contribute. And then we said already combining different methods will help you to overcome the shortcomings of each of them. So in summary, combine control tools, develop sustainable strategies, amalgamate Fred Soper's discipline with a more flexible community uh, approach, 
recognize potentials, but also the limitations of community in their involvement. Realize the programmatic differences between attack phase when I want to reduce uh, the vector densities and the maintenance phase when I want to main maintain the situation. And accept program failures as lessons which have to be learned and not close. So the final message working together, achieving together. Thank you very much. Hi, I'm, I'm sure I'm enough to do wonderful speeches. There'll be a lot of questions. My name is Sanjay Bhattacharya. I'm from the Wellcome Trust Center for the History of Medicine. Thank you all for coming. Um, I think we should uh, I want to throw the questions open to the floor. Could you please identify yourself for the sake of the webinar? The, the question answer session is also being recorded, uh, which we hope to put on, onto the GHH website in due course. So, uh, questions? Please, sir. Uh, my name is Michael Wilson. Can you switch? Uh, my name And um, I want to congratulate the two speakers for fantastic uh, knowledge that they have and the insight into malaria control. But one thing baffles me, and that is, and, and I want to throw this question at the two speakers. Why was IRS not implemented in Sub-Saharan Africa, where malaria was high endemic during the uh, 50s, 50s and 70s? Because it seems to me that uh, the results of the GAKI project must have influenced the uh, policy makers, authorities that be, to have decided not to go into it. So was it a technique? Seventies, all right, and. People were still using IRS in many parts of Africa into the 90s. I mean, they never stopped using IRS, so it didn't stop it. But the technical arguments made it more difficult for them to get resources to do IRS in many parts of Africa. Um, but I think that, and I mean not only because the resource, I mean just getting a hold of the insecticides became more and more difficult in the 70s. Uh, even if you, you know, wanted to use them. So I think that um, the politics of it in terms of the way in which international malaria control was moving away from that made it more and more difficult for those using it. And then when rollback malaria comes to the table, and a number of African countries wanted to use IRS, and they were told, you can do it, but we're not going to fund it. And that didn't really change. Political. Um, and one could argue that there are, and then the, the development of nets became a kind of alternative which was seen and shown in a number of studies to be very efficacious. And the support behind nets tended to all... Only to add in the, in the early days, in the 50s already, there were quite successful pilot experiences in several African countries. But as far as I understand, WHO and the major donor, they wanted to see it work first in the less complicated areas, the whole movement. Uh, I don't know if there were already plans to move later on into Sub-Saharan Africa, but what I have heard was basically a don't start with a very complicated situation. Speakers um, for the brilliant. I am Boy Betsy Udong from the Rollback Malaria Partnership Secretariat. Um, what I wanted to say is that um, when we saw the announcement, we were very scared because um, the um, the announcement was very misleading, saying that uh, rollback malaria approaches um, sort of have failed. Um, that's what we understood, and. Um, but moving in the same direction. But, um, and I, I really want to, to encourage everybody here 
if you have not read the Global Malaria Action Plan, you must and they are not. What, are, what the speakers have said, um, I wouldn't say that um, they've said anything negative against um, the approaches that we are, we are preaching and that we are promoting, and we are all preaching about using multi-pronged approaches. So please don't um, be misled by thinking in that malaria program or the approaches that we are preaching have failed. Thank you. Thank you, Madam. Would the speakers like to comment on this? Or? Well, I didn't suggest that they failed. In fact, certain elements which have been demonstrated to be important earlier on have been left out except for on paper. And primarily those which have to do with broader investments in health, broader investments in, in economic development, broader investments in in reducing violence and really your problem. I mean, it's not necessarily that World Bank Malaria can deal with this, but in the end of the day, if someone doesn't deal with that, the efforts of World Bank Malaria are going to be very difficult to sustain in the long term, would be my argument. Thank you, Randy. I think, uh, please. Um, I would like only to uh, add that in WHO World Bank Malaria technical documents, you find very much on the insecticides I um, think the main problem I wanted to transmit is the administration, is to get it organized, to get it to the ground, to get a reasonable um, performance level and effect level finally. And this, there's very little written about all Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I think we have three questions through our webinar system. Uh, shall I read them out? Hoogman will read them out. And, uh, okay. Uh, Peter is the uh, former professor of parasitology at Liverpool School of Tropical Medicine and then was head of the Department of Professorology at London School of Tropical Medicine. And he's asking, will any speaker refer to the serious problem of the production and sale of fake drugs, particularly ACTS? Um, yeah, I mean, it's a problem in, in a number of respects. Um, I mean, I've heard a number of talks about this, and um, the degree to which the producers of fake drugs are able to keep one step ahead of the producers of real drugs in terms of security is quite a um, that they're reproducing holograms that are being developed or that you have the authentic drug, but in fact the holograms that are produced and they're getting by. It's people that more importantly, they're getting sort of partial doses of um, artemisinin, which is the pathway down to resistance, which is the great threat, because at the moment, we have no backup for artemisinin-based drugs. And um, as far as is, is a huge political as well as a, a complicated um, public health problem. Axel, would you like to add something? or uh, Perhaps only to say that um, the same applies to insecticides, only that it's a bit perhaps theoretically easier to control. And I think uh, Hoopers here has developed uh, guidelines which start saying uh, reassure yourself uh, that the product is of the level which in fact, in the one which I showed you, the very low level of uh, insecticide on the wall, the production was good, 100% uh, achieved, so it was more the performance on the, on the ground. But again, you have to ensure the product is good. Thank you. Thank you. We have another question. Uh, 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 from Amin Bawazir, who wonders whether we could rely on the promising genetic modification of malaria. I always look to my colleague uh, Yeya, but he, everybody is in MIM. Uh, these are the people who are working professionally on it. I wouldn't 
good answer for this. Okay. Um, is there another question, Tony? Concerning the genetics. Yes, please. This is. Uh, can you please uh, speak to the? Uh, yes. Um, So, history of medicine in Geneva. Uh, concerning genetics, I think one of the most important results in recent years was the discovery that uh, Gambia is really a very complex uh, situation in which there are many subspecies. There are as apnea to wall for Macaulipenis in Europe, as very different in their uh, transmission ability. So, I think that sport should be looked at, uh, at with a lot of interest. Thank you, Bernardino. Do you want to add something, Randy? No. So we have passed. What is the current view of the two speakers with regard to malaria elimination approaches in the future? Well, I try to suggest that um, one, it needs to be sort of multi-pronged approaches. Um, but I think that that the issue of elimination and whether we can eliminate malaria in other large parts of the globe is a real open question. Um, I think it's a, a great challenge to eliminate malaria in Africa, and I think to, to go down that road may lead us into expenditures of resources that in the end of the day we'll regret that we spent. I think the real problem for Africa is how to sustain the programs that we are building under rollback malaria, and I don't believe we can sustain them depending on international aid. I mean, the history of international aid and development is that eventually will allow governments to provide for their own people and people to provide for themselves. In 10 years from now, we're in a difficult position in terms of the future of malaria control in Africa and probably a lot of other places. Thank you, Randy. Axel, would you like to add something? Uh, in fact, I would have said the same thing. basically the strengthening of the health services, how to organize health services in such a way that they can do what they are expected to do. I, I, I think we have another comment, stroke question from Amin Bazir from the Liverpool School of Tropical Medicine. Uh, he wonders whether the role of sociocultural variation in the globe has been studied and also says that approaches had not been based on this dimension because acceptance and interaction of IRS in one population could not be compared to another one uh, with different cultural and social backgrounds. I would just say that um, one of the things that's in the Global Malaria Action Plan is a, a, a very um, clear acknowledgement that we have basically failed in terms of developing communication programs that are effectively tailored for individual local situations. Um, there hasn't been enough investment in communication, and the kind of programs, again, what the action plan says, the kind of programs that have been developed have been generic, uh, and so I think uh, what the, uh, the questioner is asking is, is a very important question, and that there needs to be significantly more investments in communications. Again, that budget, uh, I may be buried in there in terms of investments in communication but I couldn't find it. So with regard to DDT, of course, there is DDT is, has a smell. You can see it on the wall. And there are automatic cultural differences to accept it or not to accept it. Um, I was um, involved in malaria service in the mid-80s in Colombia when they were still uh, spraying DDT uh, and we always found um, that acceptance was around say 60-70 percent but in th then the, the local university they had uh, some academic stations to uh, study malaria in the area where they excluded IRS so no spraying was done there and people were suffering very much from the mosquito. It's very much in which situation you are. With the modern, say, pyrethroids, uh, insecticides, you don't see them, you don't smell them. 
the social cultural differences might be less I don't know but I would fully uh, agree this it, it should be studied much better I mean from what both of you are saying a collection of information from from national context is very important but do you rely on national ie central governments to provide you with that information or how local do you go to get information is that important um, local is if you work with different say ethnic groups then you have ethnic differences yeah. But my assumption would be, without knowing it, that um, uh, mosquitoes nuisance is something we don't like, and we would be that somebody comes and does does something against it. And, and I would assume that there are not that big differences if you work with, say, uh, insecticides which are not smelling, which are not. Uh, uh, leaving something behind you, etc. No, but uh, I don't know. Okay. Yeah. I, I just say I think in the rush to get nets out um, and meet um, deadlines, that um, perhaps not enough attention has been paid to community participation. Uh, to be, I mean, there's a there's a good amount of data that shows that access to nets and usage of nets. There's a, there's But I think it's also an approach which doesn't take community participation seriously at this point. And that's sort of now going back and sort of back voting, which has happened in a number of places. Thank you, Randy. We have one more question on the webinar, and then the gentleman there wants to ask a question. What about malaria vaccines? Uh, asks Alfonso Renz. I did my master's in in the late 1970s in the London School and the people from the malaria vaccine came down to give a lecture and they said in two years we have the malaria vaccine. I think that says it all. Thank yes, you. <laughs> sir, can you please? Yes, here we are. And both the speakers indicate that very strongly the key for malaria control. What can we learn from history? What are the, because economic development is really a very wide spectrum. What are the, in history, what are the key elements of economic development that would be more important for malaria control? Randy? Well, I mean, I tried to indicate a number of places and times when there was um, an effort to integrate uh, Um, in ways which contributed to a decline in, in malaria. Um, I didn't go into them in great detail because there wasn't enough time, and I'm you know, not an economic development specialist, but I think that the, the important message I was trying to make, and which I think is verified by this example, is that it is important that we think about what are these underlying social determinants, economic determinants, and address them along with trying to deal with, with the, the insecticides and deal with uh, the vectors. Um, it's, it's evading your question in a way because I don't think I have the time to explain economic development. To extend it perhaps to other vector bond diseases, it's very clear that housing is important, particularly for chagas is very where the larvae are apparently the, 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 the one which is on the Indian subcontinent where the larvae are breeding in the houses and if you do housing improvement you don't need to spray insecticides. So sometimes you can say okay I invest my money better in housing, con better housing conditions than in insecticide spraying. Thank you. Sir. Thank you very much. Um, my name is Shiva from the Global Malaria Program. Um, Excellent two presentations, very interesting. Uh, just one or two points. Um, history and evidence is based on perceptions and understanding. I think that has to be always kept in mind and how it is interpreted. The second issue is human nature tends to work on contradic contradictions and based on ideologies and opinions. 
So getting a balance is always very difficult. And the history of malaria is a good example. We have a problem today. Coming to this critical issue of social and human development, developing health systems, how can we achieve it faster and quicker to show the necessary impact which is required urgently? That's one question. The second question is, can that be complemented with good disease control programs which work on fast impact and delivery? That they don't necessarily contradict each other, but actually should complement each other. Based on the fact that today's health investment, both national and international, is inadequate. I think vector control, malaria controls principles and parasite control. DDT and IRS went with chloroquine and quinine. So I think that's just when always the history of the malaria control is that it's parasite control and vector control. If they go one without the other, then we have serious problems. Well, to the last point, um, yes, in principle, it's correct. Um, but the end to actually provide the chloroquine and identify the cases. Um, and so you didn't, you, in some ways, there was a kind of insecticide going it alone. But the, the first questions you ask, I think, are important ones. And my answer, in some ways, is that, yes, absolutely, these two need to go together. In my own sort of mind about this, I think about, you know, like a you know, 10, 20 year kind of window here in which we have technologies which are going to allow us to dramatically reduce the burden of malaria. And that also gives us a window where we can be investing in social and economic development so that at the end of the 20 years, when no one's going to be around in this room or anywhere else is going to be wanting to throw money at this disease that we haven't brought it under control, that places will be able to control and continue and sustain those programs. So we have to get to that stage, more into social and economic development. And I'm afraid, and let alone doing any things about violence, and I'm afraid that at the end of those 20 years, we're going to be right where we're standing today with trying to get those nets out and trying to maintain that, that level of um, high level of control in Africa, but not really with an opportunity to see how we're going to sustain that. Thank you. I'm not that sure that it always goes together. It should go together, treatment and vector control. But you see it in recent times already that it's much easier to get a distribution program than to finance a whole package where you are quite unsure what the, will they do with local case management, community case management, etc. No? So it's ideal. It should be like this and everybody would, would, would underline it, but reality is sometimes different. And it comes a bit from, still from the times of Fred Soper when and they were thinking we have one weapon and this um, makes a whole difference and we put it all there. Yeah. And I was interested to see that also in Robert Koch's time already there was a discussion about uh, where to put uh, the emphasis on on, on Thompson. I'm Thompson Prentice, uh, former WHO staff member. And even before then I was um, a journalist writing on health in, uh, in the UK. And going back to uh, Axel's point about vaccines, I remember writing those stories uh, malaria vaccine on the way many times. Developing a vaccine, but maybe when we have coffee later, we could. Randall talks um, about looking 20 years ahead. I'm curious as to whether potential climate change is a fact. To the um, fly in the ointment, <clears throat> shall we say, in terms of. Is there any planning for the contingency if, should, if climate change should alter the, uh, the uh, transmission areas? Thank you. Thank you, Thompson. Malaria is an environmental disease affected by rare 
that will have an impact on malaria. And one of the areas of malaria control, which was very strongly emphasized when RBM was launched and the last few years has gone down a bit, is the area of what we call malaria epidemic and emergency control. That area has become a weak, bit weaker over the last uh, couple of years. I think we should anticipate the resurgence of malaria, definitely. Um, but also we need to put in measures for early warning and detection and rapid response. However, one should also take note of the fact that as we expand our malaria control programs, we will actually put the, the risk of climate change would become less. So as we increase the coverage with nets, with house spraying, and access to community-based ACT and health facility-based ACT, we should have less risk of expansion due to climate. But that depends on good coverage and delivery of the services. Thank you, sir. sir. Jean-Pierre Poulier, retired, so I'm on in tag. <laughs> uh, around the proposition that was made to amalgamate threat surplus discipline with flexible uh, community-directed approach, uh, three little questions. First of all, uh, is Fred Soper uh, the hair somehow of history himself in the sense that uh, we have indicated here that uh, uh, the fight against malaria, but is it not that uh, economic development has been possible when we eradicate malaria. If we take the United States, uh, the United States development started when the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers after the war, of, uh, the Civil War, was, uh, had to be maintained in office because the northern people feared still the south, and thus they used the Army Corps to clean up the Mississippi uh, shores and so on and malaria disappeared from large shores. We can take Italy uh, under Mussolini, we can take a number of areas which start to grow when that was. And thus Fred Sopa's discipline, is it not the product of seeing that large scale operations required to have some kind of military operations, which does not mean control. But I just mentioned that. The second one is related to uh, the failure and the successes of large-scale operations, uh, which come and reason, and speaking one evening with people in in the local community, and they were all unemployed, so they had nothing to do, uh, and they were kind of disappeared. I said. Well, why don't we just in this particular community, I had nothing to do with and we created a little local program in one evening. We created a local program to uh, reduce the risks in that particular community. Um, all I did was out of my uh, my pocket was to offer for uh, a tombola uh, like uh, uh, five bed nets and, and things like that. So it was minimal in terms of investment, but it was to involve people. But one of the difficulties was that it was ex very difficult for a local initiative to get any funding because you needed to address uh, agencies which can only do very large scale operations. And thus uh, we, f we, we see that constantly all over the place. And so um, uh, the, the question boils down. On the one hand, you need Fred Soper's discipline, as you mentioned, because they are large-scale operations. And on the other hand, you have to have uh, responses to, uh, to flexible community approaches. But these are difficult to marry with the uh, very large-scale operations. Now, th that's a new experience, and by the way, you have provided. Do you have in your experience found ways where one can my large-scale operations and community approaches? Please. Um, I showed you one small picture with a community cooperative in Mexico, and this was a very 
important experience. We learned from that experience. We did it in Mexico and in Colombia in, say, the conflict areas. And it worked only um, there where you have an institution behind. In Mexico, the, the social security system took this over. And they are now for 10 years more or less working with them. It worked beautifully. And uh, everybody, what they do is basically in the early days of ITNs, uh, dipping the nets, uh, uh, producing the nets, selling to uh, unities. And when the long-lasting nets came in more a kind of and sell it. This works in an environment like Mexico. It wouldn't work probably in African environments. But it to get more continuity in the programs when at some point the, the international funding was, will disappear. Now, with regard to IRS spraying, uh, I've worked quite a lot with spraying teams now in India, Nepal, or on the the other side also in Latin America, um, they have still very much and exclusively this, uh, perhaps to a certain extent, let me say, the discipline, but they don't have good, they have no training to deal with communities. They come in complicated terminology, technical terms to tell them what is happening, what is, etc. No, but it's only to show, oh, I'm higher status. It's not, oh, you are my, my uh, uh, friend or you are from my own tribe, from my community. So I think there a lot has to be done. But, but your last question, I don't see. Um, I see it now for, we, we are trying to work out, particularly in Bangladesh, where they have lost vector control for 20 years. They start with IRS, which I find really a challenge from from nothing, but the program they did and, and the research teams did a unity dipping of nets with a new slow release insecticide etc. I think there is a good chance of combining these two and uh, in fact what A quick question after which we can um, Jessica from the School of Oriental and African Studies. And my question is about local perceptions, because we've said that uh, malaria is one of the big diseases that we have to eliminate, but we haven't really talked a lot about what people's perception of the disease is. Um, and my experience working in Malawi and Mozambique is that people take it as a common cold and they say, I have a little bit of malaria today and I live with families in Mozambique. Nobody slept with bed nets. And so I was wondering if the speakers could comment on that. But I think that um, I mean, it's an important question to think about because I think the notion of I can say that's difficult, if not impossible, to do, but it, it may well be possible. And we're dealing with a disease which, as you say, in many places is like having the flu, which isn't a nice thing to have, as many of you probably know, but it's not, maybe not worth the billions you're going to put into trying to eliminate the last case. So um, how people perceive is an important thing, and it's also important in terms of how, how much they're actually going to cooperate in whatever programs you put into place. Excellent. When we published a paper on uh, dengue vector control through insecticide-treated wind, the fix for areas. Why don't you try it here as well? Because we have lots of problems to introduce bed nets in urban areas, urban communities. I think there's still a lot of, uh, let's say, research gaps to fill in and to what in this specific environment I think is important for them.
Thank you very much. So um, thank you for coming. Thank Thank you to all departments of the WHO involved uh, in this project, and I look forward to next month's talk, which is going to feature Jeremy Green from Harvard University and Ada Lucas, who I'm sure many of you know. So thank you very much for coming.